Right, well, I think we can get going. Um, there's some bad weather outside, so I'm sure a lot of people will still come a bit later. But uh, we're using the other auditorium on the other side of the uh, of the uh, JSC as well, so they won't get in your way. So if you've got a nice, comfortable seat, that's fine. Stay where you are. Um, and we'll run whatever we're showing here will be shown in the other auditorium as well. So it's uh, miracles of science. Um, I'm Mike Brown from ETFSA. Um, and... Uh, Myself and Narina Fissel will be doing the, the, uh, the presentation. This presentation is really designed for first-time investors and particularly for people in uh, group investments, stock fells, investor clubs, and so on. So if it's a little bit uh, um, uh, not too sophisticated for some of you who know a lot about ETFs, we apologize for that, but we will be covering quite a bit of ground in, in this investment. But we do want to try and inform people who want to know about this wonderful world of ETFs, how to get involved and what to do and so on. So uh, um, so this is quite a, a spread type of investment, uh, sorry, a presentation to get you into investments and to tell you about ETFs. And obviously we're going to do it in about an hour, so we don't have all that <laughs> much time and we can't cover everything. But let me get going. So investing in ETFs. Right, so what, if, what are ETFs? And first of all, let me just uh, apologize. I'm right at the end of a really bad bout of gastro, or whatever they call it, which is a serious thing going around in Joburg. And even though I'm feeling quite a bit better and it's no longer contagious, <laughs> um, I'm not at my best. So Narina will have to make up for me by being more than her charming best, while I'll probably be a bit dull <laughs> more than usual. But uh, yeah, um, so if I'm not my normal charming self, uh, that's probably what it's all about. What are ETFs? <clears throat> uh, they shares, list on the JSC, so you come to the JSC and you buy an ETF just like you buy any share any, any share in a company. They trade like any normal share on the main board, but instead of giving the performance of a single company, they give you the performance of a whole portfolio or multi-asset company investment exposure. So when you come in the JSC and you buy a share, it started at the top ABSA or African Rainbow, you're buying the performance of that one particular company. When you're buying an ETF, you're buying the performance of a whole portfolio of shares. That's why they call them exchange traded. They trade on the stock exchange and funds because a fund is more than one investment. So what you're getting is you're getting a multi-investment by buying a single ETF. And uh, that concept most people seem to understand, and that's great. Um, now, in order to track a portfolio of investments, the, uh, an ETF tracks an index. And what an index is, it's something that the stock exchange themselves calculates or index calculators utilize to say these are the companies that trade the most on the stock exchange and these are the companies that have, that have the most to do with, uh, with uh, price movements on the exchange. And we'll put those companies in an index and we'll monitor their performance. And that index then gives you the average return of the market. It says how is the market as a whole doing? Now, you don't need to use every single share in the stock market to do that. If you use the top 40 index on the JSC, that accounts for 90% of all the trade on the JSC happens just in those top 40 shares. So if you have an index of the top 40 shares in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, you effectively are getting the performance of that whole market. And an index measures performance every 15 seconds. <laughs> so don't get around to it once a month or something like that. Every 15 seconds, the index upgrades, it updates. So an index is giving you all the time the effective return of the markets. Every single trade in those big companies is registered electronically, the price changes, and that then gives you the performance of the market. So when you listen on the radio and they say the all share index went up 1% or fell by half a percent today, they're saying the performance of that basket of shares, whether it's the S&P 500 in America, the FTSE 100 in the UK, or the JSC 40, top 40 in South Africa, that's what that is. Now, an ETF gives you exposure to that index. When you buy an ETF, you're buying exposure to the index. And uh, let's just discuss a little bit more what an index is. So here you have the top 40 index. And this is alphabetical, so it starts at Anglo, uh, Anglo Ashanti, a gold mining company. Anglo American goes all the way down, Discovery at the bottom, first ran down to Mondi. Some of you are saying, well, that doesn't look like 40 companies to me, so there's page two. So you've got two pages of companies, and that's the top 40 index, all the way down to Woolworths. And <clears throat> when you measure the performance of the top 40 index, what you're measuring is the performance of each of those 40 shares all the time. 
what's cha what price changes are taking place in those 40 shares and what price movements are determining what's happening in the market as a whole. So an index is a very good way of getting exposure to a stock market. Whether it's just buying a top 40 index of shares or buying a bond index or buying an index of, say, property shares or specialized areas of the market, the index basically gives you just the top companies and it gives you the performance of all those top companies. And, uh, and that's what an index is. Now, until fairly recently, it was very difficult to buy an index. <laughs> but with more recent progressions, and that's really what ETFs are all about, ETFs have now come and given you, as an average investor, an opportunity to participate in the performance of the stock market by buying an index. Now, that index effectively, as I said, there's 40 shares in there. Um, and let's look at them. Some of them are bigger than others. Here's Nasperse, which doesn't just do DSTV broadcast football and stuff like that, also owns a company called Tencent, which is the biggest IT company in China, which adds about 2 million clients every, every second week or something like that. So, so he has NASPERSE, which is the biggest company in the JSC. So they're saying with NASPERSE, if you want to measure the performance of the market, 23% of the market's trade and performance determination happens <coughs> at one share. And some other shares which don't trade as much, let's take Woolworths, which just sells, you know, women's underwear and stuff like that and so on. Um, that only, that's only 0.82%. So if you want to track this index and you had 100 Rand to invest, you would put 23 Rand 44 into nice purse, 1 Rand 95 into Mondi and 82 cents into Woolworths. And by doing that, you would actually own the index. Your portfolio exactly reflects the index. And that's all an ETF does. He owns the index. The portfolio manager is 100% covered. He owns all the shares in the index, and you then buy a participatory interest in that index by buying an ETF, which is physically 100% covered, and he owns all those shares. So for every single ETF he issues, he owns the underlying portfolio, which means that his portfolio performs exactly the same as the market. So you're getting the performance of the market. And that's quite a new concept. <laughs> Because in the old days, old blokes like me <laughs> thought, well, we were smart. We could outperform the market. <laughs> but the market's now become very sophisticated. And there's trading mechanisms, there's algorithms, and there's all sorts of things like that. That, in fact, just buying an index is increasingly becoming the best type of investment to look at. So that's what the index is. So is the index well worthwhile? Well, it's well diversified. Because if you buy the Satrix 40 or the Ashburton Top 40 or the New Funds Top 40, those are all ETFs that track the Top 40 index, you're buying a little bit of all those 40 shares. I buy one ETF and I own a little bit of all those Top 40 companies in the JSE. That's great. That's a bargain. <laughs> it's a box of chocolates. I own all 40 of the chocolates in, the, in that box. And uh, some of the chocolates are bigger than others, but that's what it's all about. So it's well diversified, very well diversified. And diversification is a good thing. <laughs> Don't take a bet on one thing, take a bet on lots of things. I mean, everyone knows that. So diversification is a good thing. They typically only cover the blue chip stocks. As I've said, there's 500 shares on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, but 90% of the trade happens in those top 40 companies. <laughs> the rest of them don't really matter all that much. <laughs> so only the top companies, the biggest companies, go into an index. So you're always buying a blue chip portfolio. Blue chip portfolio is the best portfolio you can buy. And due to wood failure means your risk is lower and your volatility is lower. Um, it's a very high quality wood failure. But a big thing with the index, if you and I had to go out there to our friendly stockbroker, you know, the guy that always beats you when you play golf and so on, and you say, I want to buy the top 40 shares in the JSC, he's going to charge you stock brokerage 40 times and JSC settlement fees 40 times and all the other costs 40 times. You buy the index, you buy one ETF, you only pay that, that fee once. So it's a bargain. I'm buying that portfolio and I'm only paying one single fee for that single ETF. So from a cost point of view, it's massively efficient. And they're very transparent. You always know what's in an index. You wouldn't be able to track an index if you don't know what's in the index. Every single day, every ETF publishes what's in its portfolio. So you know exactly what's in the portfolios of all these ETFs. So indexes are worthwhile. How do they do? Well, an index gives you the average return of the market. And that's 
I don't want to go into the mathematics because I'm not a mathematical guy anyway, but the average is always, an index is always the average. Consumer price index is the average price, average level of inflation in South Africa. And the consumer confidence level is the average level of confidence in the economy. A, uh, an index gives you the average return of a stock market. Who wants to be average? <laughs> Everybody thinks they're better than average, particularly the girls. So, you know, the blokes, the blokes know we've been barbreed and we know we're basically average, but, uh, you know, we don't tell anybody that. But here's a study that takes place, and there's quite a few of these. This is S&P, Standard and Poor's. These are the blokes that are going to give us a credit downgrade on Friday. Um, but they also do these studies around the world, and they say how many managers who promise to outperform the index, because an active manager, you take him his money, he says, I'll give you above average returns, because I'm going to charge you a fancy fee. How many of those guys can actually outperform the index? And this slide's quite interesting. This is in the USA, using the S&P Standard Poor 500 as a benchmark. Over periods of one, three, and five years, 88% over five years and 93% over three years, of all the managers in America, and there's thousands and thousands of them, can't beat the index. <laughs> and the same thing in Europe and the same thing in South Africa and across the world. That's the situation. So what it's basically saying is that markets are becoming more and more efficient. Stock markets... All the information and all the data that determines the price of shares is known to the market. If it's not known to the market, you've got to let the market know. You've got to put out a sense announcement saying there's some information that may affect the price of my share. So markets are very efficient. So to, for you to outperform an efficient market, you've either got to be a genius, and geniuses are, you know, they're okay for a while and then they go bad, or you've got to be very lucky. <laughs> And the average, as I've said, across the world is that 85% of all active managers, so we're not picking on anybody, you know, Coronation, Alan Gray, whatever these guys are, we're not, we're not going to pick on anybody. 85% of those guys can't outperform a pure, simple index tracker. So what's the fastest growing industry in the world? ETFs, tracking passive investments. Because <laughs> even the dodos like me understand, <laughs> might as well just buy the index. <laughs> getting diversified portfolio, low cost and all the rest. So that's, and in fact, in South Africa very recently, because a lot of people have been complaining to me how badly their active managers are doing, and ETFSA is doing quite well, in fact, if you invested with us. And I did the survey for myself up to September. 93% of all the actively managed unit trusts tracking the general equity fund couldn't outperform the all-share index for the year to the end of September. <laughs> Markets, sometimes people don't fully understand what's happening in the market. The market's moving up. How many people know we're in a bull market in the JSC? The all share index is up 25% this year. <laughs> Most people don't understand that. But if you bought the index, your portfolio is up 25%. Because <laughs> that's what's happening. The market is actually going up. One or two shares are driving it, but nonetheless, it's still going up. So that's the case for buying an index. Index is passive investment. You just buy an index active as you try and outperform the index. Not saying to you that you shouldn't try and outperform the index yourself with a bit of your money or go and find a manager who can do it for you, but bring some of your money to a passive manager because <laughs> that's the best thing you'll ever do. <laughs> that passive manager will give you that performance all the time at low cost and uh, that'll be the basis of your growth and wealth. Now, ETFs, I don't want to spend too much time on them because Noreen is going to talk. Uh, she's got a nice presentation looking at ETFs and what sort of different ones they are and what they do and so on. The big thing with ETFs, if you're going to track an index, you've got to do it at the lowest cost possible because uh, you don't want to go and spend a lot of money tracking an index and you don't need to spend a lot of money because you just need decent software and things like that to do it. The average total expense ratio, which is the cost of providing a product for South African ETFs is about 36 basis points a year. That's 0,3%, 0,36%. Index tracking unit trusts, which are also quite cheap, are double that total expense ratio which means your index tracking unit trust, all things being equal, will underperform an ETF because they're more expensive. <laughs> because a unit trust is a much more expensive mechanism, a structure to do investments in than an ETF. And if you go to an active manager, active uh, unit trust equity funds, their total expense ratios are 1,56%. This is the last figures for the end of September this year. So they're charging you five times more than the ETF. Now, it's very difficult to make up for that, that higher cost. You've got to be very good. <laughs> You've got to perform particularly well to make up for that cost drag. 
And you get it right occasionally, but you don't always get it right. And so that's why ETFs are, are quite attractive from a cost point of view. And as I said to you, you're buying your ETF, you're getting all your shares, any paying brokerage you want. So very transparent, you know what your index constituents are all the time. They're very easily accessible. You can buy an ETF through your stockbroker, through your bank, through your online system. You can come to ETFSA or other online platforms that are now providing access to these things. And I'll talk a bit later about that. But they're very easily accessible and they're very safe because you're buying a share and the JSC guarantees your ownership of that share. And the central custodian system, electronic, it's no longer a case of paper certificates being passed around and guys hijacking guys on their buzz bikes and things like that and stealing pieces of paper and so on. This is all e electronic. There hasn't been a failed trade in the JSC in the last 10 years. So they're a very safe way of, of investing. <clears throat> So, okay, now let's talk a little bit about investor clubs and stock fills and so on. And I know there's quite a big group coming in from various places. <clears throat> now, some of you know about this, but the big thing with uh, an investor club <clears throat> or stock fill, and this includes funeral societies, burial societies, things like that, they have a special dispensation in the South African Act <clears throat> that the, government, that the uh, FSB says that you don't have to have a financial services license <clears throat> to operate as a stock fill. Because what a stock fill is doing is it's collecting money from a group of people and then it's going and investing that money on behalf of that group. So normally you'd need a banking license to collect deposits from people or you'd need, at least need a, a financial services provider license. But provided you have the right structure, you can do that within a stock fill or investor club. And the right structure says that you must have a constitution or a founding statement. So you can't just do something yourself. You've got to have a constitution. Everybody's got to agree to that constitution. And that's not all that difficult because you can Google a constitution. Just Google constitution stock fell and about a thousand of these damn things pops up. If you don't want to do that, go to the ETFSA website and we'll, we've got a constitution on there. So you can do that quite easily. But you've got to have that document saying this is our club. This is what we do. And this is what our intentions are. And this is the structure and all that sort of stuff. So once you've got a constitution, like South Africa, we've got a constitution. And it seems to work somehow, you know, I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> I mean, our Zoom is always having a problem with this damn constitution. They always want to take them to court and so on. But once you've got a founding statement constitution, that, that helps a lot. And you've got to have that for a stock fill. Then you've got to appoint an authorized person. So you've got to appoint somebody responsible in the group. So that's what these two old blokes here on the front row, Rob and... Uh, <clears throat> They uh, get somebody decent, like a, a girl is a woman who's an accountant or something like that. They're the authorized person. They then act on behalf of the stock firm or the investor club. And you then appoint them to do that. And you sign a letter saying this person can act on behalf of us in terms of our group, our club, our stock firm, whatever have you. And because you don't want every single person in the investor club phoning up the stockbroker and giving instructions, buy this, sell this, and so on. It doesn't work. So you've got to appoint an authorized representative. That authorized representative has to be somebody who's using reliable, and they've got to have FICA documents and all the rest. So don't pour your skill them to do it. You know, they've got to have somebody who can pass all the ID documents and all that sort of stuff. Keep a copy of register of investors. You don't have to give that to administrators, but you have to have a copy of all the people who are members of your club. Um, you have to have a bank statement in the name of the club or the stock firm. The money can't flow from anybody's individual bank statement. So you've got to set up a bank statement. Now, that's not a big problem if you go to the bank, even though they're pretty dim, most of these bankers, you say, I want to open an account for a stock fill, they'll, they'll do it. You know, they'll find a form and get you to fill it in and stuff like that. So, so that's a, a critical factor. And all the money that goes into and out of that stock fill, Vista Club has to go through that bank statement. Then we just need the FICA documents for the authorized person, the person who's responsible for running that club. Now, if you do that, you can run an investor club. Whether it's two or three people, your mates, <laughs> the girls you go shopping with on a Saturday morning and you decide you want to start an investor club or you want to turn your book club into an investor club. My daughter did that and it's never heard the end from us ever since because they don't read books anymore. They just talk about investment. But, you know, whatever it is. Or you want to do much more structured and we've got communities with lots and lots of people forming investor clubs or stock fills and so on. As long as you have that structure in place, you're legal. <laughs> And that structure works. How would you use these exchange-traded products, exchange-traded funds in, in uh, investor club stock fills? Well, 
generally speaking, your best way of doing it is to is to try and diversify your portfolio. Don't put everything all into one ETF. Put it into a diversified portfolio of different ETFs covering bonds, equities, listed property, other asset classes. This is like you, when you go and invest your stock for money in, a, in the stock market, you don't buy one share. You can try and go and buy a couple of shares. So same thing with ETFs. Go and buy a portfolio of different ETFs. Low costs, don't need to invest in performance. That's very important. Investment minimums are very low. I'll talk a bit about this later. All the ETFs on the JSC pay dividends at least twice a year, but most of them four times a year. So that dividend flow, that income flow, can help meet some of your costs in your, in your stock fill, or you can reinvest the dividends and therefore try and grow your investment. So we've got in the ETFSA, we've got the ETFSA investor plan, which is used for uh, small investors. So we accept investments from a thousand rand, whether it's from an individual, lump sum, or from a stock fill, a thousand rand is a minimum investment, so you don't need a lot of money <laughs> to get going. Because you've got a lot of money, well, that's also okay. Process debit orders from 150 rand a month. So I'm collecting, I've got 20 members that are all giving me 100 bucks a month. That's 2,000 rand a month. I don't have to put that all into one ETF. I can split it into something like eight or nine, eight ETFs or so, eight or nine ETFs, 150 rand per month in each of them. So I can spread my investment. And that's obviously quite a good way to do things. We automatically reinvest the dividends four times a year. We pay them out to you, whatever you want. There's a fee of 0.8% brokerage. So on a, on a thousand rand investment, you pay 80 cents stock brokerage. What can you buy for 80 cents? <laughs> that pays a stockbroker, <laughs> which means the trade goes to the stock exchange. <laughs> so, uh, and then we charge an annual fee of between 0.35 to 0.65%, depending on the size of the investment. And that, that fee is only collected over a 12 month period. So 0.65% means six rand 50 a year. <laughs> On a thousand rand investment. What can you buy for six rand fifty? So these investments don't have to be expensive. Because huh? what you're doing is you're buying listed securities on the JSC, going through efficient trading platforms and all the rest, and the costs are down. Costs are low. Nobody's trying to squeeze high profits out of you. An ETFSA is specialized in ETFs only. Now you can do that if you're an individual investor or if you're a stock fell. And there's our website. I think a lot of you are already clients of ours. You know how to get hold of our website and see what we offer there in terms of, in terms of those structures. But let's look at now at, at uh, portfolios that you can utilize. I said to you, I think it's a better idea to have a portfolio of ETFs than just pick one or two ETFs. There's now 83. I've got the 82 ETFs. There's now 83 of the damn things on the JSC. Next week, there'll probably be 84, but they, a lot of them are listing. So there's quite a big selection now. All the information you need on every single ETF is on the ETF as a website, fact sheets, profile documents, explanations, and so on. But it's quite a big study. But there's not 500 shares like they're on the JSC. It's still a lot smaller, or 1,300 unit trusts. It's still a much smaller universe than unit trusts or shares. So you can select your own portfolio, and that's often what you do with an investor club. You all get together, you go to some guy and say, you go and study this ETF. We want to buy a China ETF. Go and buy us an ETF that just invests in China. Come back to the next meeting and tell us all about it. And they say, oh, how did I do that? But you go on the ETF as a website, you download China, you, get, you find that there's a fact sheet, tells you exactly what shares you're buying, et cetera, et cetera, what the product is, all that sort of stuff. That person then reports back, you discuss it, you agree, you then go ahead with your investment strategy. If you want advice, and we can't really give advice until we know the client, until we've done some study of the client and that sort of thing. So we really only give advice if the investments are more than 100,000 Rand or higher. But we certainly will try and help you get going. If you've got more money than that, you've got a million Rand or more, then we can run the whole portfolio for you. ETFs say we'll use its expertise, Narina, myself, we don't know much, but we know a lot about ETFs. And that's one thing that we do know about. Therefore, we can, we can make a big difference in terms of us knowing exactly what each of those 82 ETFs do, where the strengths and weaknesses are, what they can do to build our portfolios. And Narina will talk more about this. So whether you're doing a stock fill or investor club or you're doing your own investments, you can select your own portfolios on that very cheap platform I spoke to you about. Come and talk to us if you, if you need some advice or bring us your money to manage, whether it's local or international. I'm talking about 82 ETFs in South Africa. There's 6,000 if you want to take money offshore, 
And we manage now quite a lot of offshore portfolios for people who, are, who, um, who have money outside of South Africa. So let's I'll look just very briefly and then I'll, 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 I'll quit. I'm still vaguely ahead. My voice is still going um, on, on just a, a general portfolio. So you don't have to be all that sophisticated on doing a portfolio, but let's just get some idea. And what you do when you're looking at portfolio allocations, you look at allocating money to certain types of assets. And assets are things like equities, bonds, listed property, maybe commodities, maybe other alternative type assets. So that's the sort of portfolio strategy you would look at. And yeah, this is a very simple one. We're saying in this particular portfolio, we're going to put 25%, sorry, 15% uh, into interest-bearing assets. Interest rates are quite low in South Africa at the moment, so you're not going to put a lot of money into interest-bearing assets at this point. Might be different down the road. I can still remember when you get 25% return on a government bond. You didn't buy anything except government bonds. As long as you thought those guys were going to go bust, you might get 25%. You know, if you do anything else, just go and sleep. But uh, no longer you can only get, what, 8 9% on a government bond, which is now not all that substantial given the risks. So let's put 15% in interest-bearing assets. Let's put 30% into foreign investments. Let's put 20% into listed property. Let's put 35% into South African equities. That's your asset allocation strategy. And that's what you discuss and you decide. Or you get your financial advisor to tell you what he thinks is the best asset allocation strategy. And you can pick any sort of strategy. But if you do that, I've also given you a series of different ETFs you can use in that portfolio. For instance, the foreign equities, we're putting 10% to the 30% allocating foreign equities, we're putting the S&P 500, which is the American stock market. We're putting 10% into the world stock market which means you now own a portfolio of all the top companies around the world. So you own a little bit of everything. Google, Microsoft, Samsung. Oh, that's a world portfolio run by MSCI, Morgan Stanley Composite Index. And we're putting 10% into China. And the same thing in South Africa, we're putting money into industrial index, a smart beta product, equity momentum, and so on. That portfolio would have given you 16.8% per annum. That's the actual return for the past five years at, as at 8th of November. So I haven't updated it too. That's about two weeks ago. Now, 16.8% is not bad. <laughs> what do you get when you put your money in the bank? <laughs> yeah, to be lucky, probably five after tax. <laughs> so yeah, you've got a diversified portfolio. You're spreading your risk. <laughs> you're having a bit of fun. You're moving to different asset classes. You're learning about investment and, you, and you're getting a bit of performance. And we could make a lot more than 16.8% if we had a more aggressive portfolio there. This is a very standard type of asset allocation strategy. Just to make the point, and I, I love emphasizing things, how good is 16.8%? Well, let's look at our very uh, vaunted uh, unit trust industry in South Africa. Here's the ETF as a performance, 16.8% total return each and every year over the past five years. Here's the average return of all the high equity unit trusts in South Africa, 10.2%, 60% lower. <laughs> Average return of the medium equity unit trust. Average return of the low equity unit trust. Even the guys who just invest in equities, don't look at balanced portfolios, bonds and other things, their portfolio returns would have only been 12.5%. So you can go and pick a portfolio of ETFs. And not only do you get the average return of the market, but you're beating all these geniuses. <laughs> Isn't that nice? <clears throat> so that's what ETFs are all about. <laughs> They give you those sort of returns. Just to find these, uh, give you two final examples. Let's say you're a, a stock fell and you're one of these more prosperous ones, and there's some very prosperous ones around, including some, some of the clients we run. And you've got now 100,000 Rand to invest. And we put 100,000 Rand into that portfolio I gave you on that pie chart. So we're putting it in, allocating it 10, 5%, whatever have you amongst those. I think it was 10 different ETFs. So there's your 100,000 Rand. After five years, that 100,000 Rand has grown to 223,000 Rand. So your money's doubled. 16.8% per annum means your money more than doubles over a five year period. In fact, it doubles over just over a four year period. So that's quite good investment. <laughs> so, one of the things you also got to do when you're looking at investor clubs and stock fills is to try and keep your money intact. Don't suddenly have got a bit of profit. Let's go and take all that profit out and go and spend it for Christmas. <laughs> you can take some profit, but much better to try and keep that money growing over time. If let's say you also, you're a, you're a stock fill and you say, well, you know, now, now I'm jumping a gun. Uh, 
we're getting money in every single month. So now we're getting 10,000 Rand a month. And this is just an example. Let's say you, you were getting less than that, maybe 1,000 Rand a month. So you could put 100 Rand in each of those, those 10 different ETFs. Let's say you're putting 10,000 Rand a month. After five years, and these are actual numbers, that 10,000 Rand a month would have grown to 865,000. <laughs> plus the 223,000 for your lump sum amount. So how do you start an investor club stock fill that becomes a millionaire in five years? You buy a portfolio of ETFs. Those are actual numbers. That's what's actually happened. So you've got to have a couple of bucks. So you've got to go and find some guys who got some money, but communities are becoming very good at saving. They're no longer giving money away to funeral policies and educational policies and so on. They're saying, no, we can do our own investments and we'll set up our clubs or community centers and so on, do investments. So that's just leaving you with a couple of ideas of what to do. Narina will talk a lot more on this and I'll come back at the end if there's any general questions, but both Narina and myself will be around for you to chat to us later. Here's all our contact details and so on if you need to contact us and all our stuff is outside. So thanks very much for your patience and I, uh, and I hope that we'll be able to chat later. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, there we go. It does. It does. Thank you very much, Mike. I hope you all feel extremely honored to be here tonight because Mike got out, out of his sick bed to be here tonight for all of you. So, Mike, thank you very, very much for doing this despite the, the horrible tummy bug. Um, it's great to have all of you here. And for those of you who I can't see, who I know is in the auditorium on the other side, um, for me, it's amazing to see the desire that people have to learn more about investments and more about ETFs that tonight we are so fully booked that we've actually had to make use of the auditorium of the JSC, which is on the other side of the atrium. So there's a whole lot of people there that I'm also talking to that you and I can't even see, but they are out there. So thank you for being here. Um, Mike made some very important points tonight, and some of them I'm going to be reiterating because I think it's so important that you do know what those things are. And I think probably one of the most important points that he made is this issue of, of the time and the consistency in sticking with an investment portfolio and not changing it all the time. So much of what he showed you tonight is really about how one can build up wealth um, in, in a reasonably secure time. But the idea is that you've got to be consistent with it, that you've got to stick with a plan and not chop and change and not expect that performance in a month or two, but to realize that in three years, in five years, in 10 years, and certainly over your lifetime, you will be able to actually build up the wealth that um, uh, and, and ownership in the stock market really, really allows you to do. So, I want to just take a step back and, and, and remind ourselves what, not just what ETFs are, but maybe in particular, what are ETFs not? ETFs are not a get-rich-quick scheme. So if you're here tonight thinking that this is, this is the next big thing, I'm going to um, actually get uh, my Christmas uh, bonus, I'm going to make up for myself, and I'm going to get my kids' school fees for next year and, and my holiday oh, um, overseas in December right now, between now and Christmas. No, sorry, you're at the wrong place. This is not where that is going to happen. I can give you directions to the cl no, clearest, the clearest, the closest or the nearest casino. Um, certainly no guarantee, but that's definitely not what we're about here. Um, ETFs is also not about trading in individual shares or companies. And I'm going to talk a bit tonight about what does it actually mean to own shares in a company. But ETFs is not about buying those individual company um, shares. It is about that basket, that index of, of uh, a portfolio of shares that you get in a single one. I know I'm, I'm making a noise. What is my deal? Oh, something, it's fallen. There we go. That's what's in my shoulder. Thank you. I thought, what's happening down here? Thank you. So does that mean that on the other side they also didn't hear properly? That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Thanks, Sigley. It's dropped again. Thank you. At least I've got people looking out for me here. Let's try this one more time. Third time lucky. Let's hope it's going to stay. You're all... You're all on mic watch, microphone watch. Okay, right. Cool. So what are ETFs also not? It is not Forex trading. And if you are into Forex trading, no, let me rather not say anything. <laughs> Uh, because this is being recorded, so best I not say anything about forex trading. This is certainly not it, and forex trading is certainly not the way to wealth. 
other than for the people who sell you the courses while posing on their fake Porsches and Lamborghinis online on your Facebook um, feed. Enough said about forex trading. ETFs or investing in ETFs is also not going to provide you with an income right now. This is something that takes time to actually build up. I want to use the analogy of planting a seed, planting a seed of, let's say, an apple tree, for example. That's what an investment in an ETF is. You're planting a seed and now you're going to wait. You're going to allow the water, the sun to do its thing so that it ultimately grows to be the big tree that actually has the apples. And the apples is your income that you will receive. So when we also get to the point where we've spent enough time waiting for it and it's grown big enough that we can actually get apples from it, that's what we do. We're actually going to be eating the apples from the tree. We're not going to chop the tree down and use it for firewood because then it's gone. Then we can't use it again. We only want, we are only interested in the fruit that we get from our investment. And that is what the income component is. But that's not going to happen on day one. So that's also not something I, we often get people that come and say, um, I've got a thousand rand to invest. How much money can I, how much income can I get from that? And they're looking for it right away. That's not how it works. So I'll try and share with you how it does work. So what does investing in ETFs provide you? It is about building up wealth. And building up wealth, the key there is in the building component, that this is something that takes time and, and that we need to buy into over a period of time. It's about buying a share in the South African economy as well. Most of us, not just, well, all of us live here in the economy, but most of us also work here in the economy. And the time that you spend going to the office or going to the factory or going to the mine or spending time in your shop or whatever it is that your day job is, that for that you can only be rewarded for the time and effort that you put into it. By buying and invest, buying shares in companies and investing in ETFs allows you to actually own a part of a business that you don't have to go to. You don't have to rock up for work to get some of the benefits of that business. That's the South African economy and investments allow you to buy a part of that investment in the South African economy. It's about getting ownership of what's happening on the JSC. We've got so much focus in terms of who owns what in this country, who owns the shares on the JSC. Well, here's an opportunity for you for a relatively modest amount of money to start buying your share of ownership of the companies on the JSC. And as I said, best left alone for at least a three to five year period. And the longer you let it go, the more apple trees you will have, the healthier your apples will be, and the more sustainable it will be for you to live off those apples into your, into your later years. I want to then just quickly stop on the idea of what's the difference between savings and investments. Because I think for a lot of people, the concept of saving is something that we're quite familiar with. You put your money in the bank, you take your money to the bank, you know what interest rate you're going to be receiving from the bank. So in the case of, in the, in the case of savings, what we're looking at is we are looking at something where we have got money that we plan to spend at some future date. And we need to be sure that that money that we've got is well preserved. So capital preservation really means to preserve it so that you don't lose it or that it doesn't go away. Certainly it started out maybe with putting the money under the mattress or keeping it in the coffee jar in the kitchen or whatever the case might be. It was all about preserving that capital and the focus was just on, on, on what interest one could possibly get from the bank for that. Investment is something very different. Investing is about buying assets, acquiring assets that can generate an income for you in future, as I explained in terms of, of the example of apple trees. The focus with investment is about growing your capital. In the case of saving, that capital amount that you put into the bank, the capital can't grow. If you put 100 rand in, it's just the 100 rand that is there. It can't get more. But investments give you the ability to actually grow that capital over time and make your money more in terms of what you originally put in. So let's think in terms of savings in the bank. So let's say, for example, I've got 100 rand and I now put 100 rand in my savings account in the bank. And the bank says to me they will pay me a 3% interest rate per annum, for example. What does that actually mean? It means that after one year, I will receive an extra 3 rand from the bank. So now my money is worth 103 rand. So you feel like, yes, I've now got more money. I've got 103 rand. Nothing more, 
but nothing less. Got the 103 rand, so yay, win, I grew my money. But then there's this little problem. Something that just happened again today is we got the inflation rate announcement. Now today it came out at 4.8%. We're sitting typically with inflation of around about 5 to 6%, so over 5%. So what does inflation really mean? It means that your money becomes worth less because it's about what can I actually do with that 100 rand. So now after a year, my money in the bank is now 103 rand. But when I go to the shop to go and buy what I could buy for 100 rand last year, they now tell me that it costs 105 rand because inflation is 5%. So now my 103 rand is not enough to buy that that now costs 105 rand. And that is one of the major problems with savings and why saving on its own does not create wealth in the long term. Because the amount of interest that you can earn on money that is in the bank is not enough to compensate you for the inflation effect. And why it is so important that one has to go into investments, acquiring assets that over the long term has got the ability to grow faster than inflation. Because what happens with my 100 Rand that I, that I put into the stock market? Well, I'm going to buy shares and companies, and we're going to talk about that a little bit just now. But that 100 Rand that I put into the stock exchange, on average, and this is quite an important idea, on average over the last 50 years, it will give you 20% per annum. So great, after one year, I now have 120 Rand on average. There are years that it lost 20%. So your 100 Rand could become 80 Rand. And there are also years where you could get 35%. So your 100 Rand could become 135 Rand. So for many people, the fear of investing in the stock market is all about focusing on the, on the fact that I could lose 80, uh, that, that 20% in one year. And I don't want to take that risk. But do you see the risk of only saving in the bank? You've got a guaranteed knowledge that you will never get more than that interest rate, 3% in my example. So the only way that we overcome this problem of potentially in one year in the market losing quite a bit of money is that you don't only invest for one year. Why you need to invest for three years, for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years, because over that long term, we find that on average we get the 20% per annum. And that's why time in the market, staying in the market, staying invested is so incredibly important, especially when the market drops. When the market drops, that's when everybody panics and says, oh, let me sell. And what do you do now? Now you lock in that 80 Rand. Now your 80 Rand will never become 100 or 100 or 135 Rand because you've actually taken it out of the market. You need to actually leave it in the market so that it can continue to grow and give you that 20% on average return that it could give you. So what does it mean if I say I'm buying shares in a company? So effectively what you're doing when you're buying shares in a company is you are giving your money to the owners of that company. I'm being very simplistic here, but I want to just get the message across of what it means. So you are giving your money to the owners of the company. And what do they do with that money? Well, they do what business owners do. They use it to run the business and to make profits. That's great. So now you've just gone and made someone else rich. Well, actually, no, because you own part of that business by buying that share in the company. So what the business does and what the owners do is some of those profits that they make, it's like seeds. They put it back into the ground and they reinvest that and they use that to grow the business even bigger and even more. And some other profits, they actually pay out to you as the investor in the form of dividends. So your money that you put in grows the business, grows it bigger and bigger over time. And some of it comes back to you also as a form of an income into the business. And then over time, how do you make money from being invested in shares? Where does that 20% on average growth comes from? Well, it comes from the fact that when you receive those dividends, you get them not just once, you get them every year, twice a year, sometimes four times a year, you get these dividends. So as long as you still own the shares, as long as you haven't sold it, you will be receiving that dividends, that little bit of money that comes back to you all the time. That's while you own the shares. And then, of course, there's the opportunity somewhere down the line to say, I'm now going to sell the shares. And if one has waited long enough, typically those shares would be worth a lot more 
than when you first bought them. And that's the so-called capital gain that we make. That is how you grow your capital and grow your wealth, because you're selling those shares at a profit, at a higher price than what you originally paid for them. And those are really the two components of growing wealthy by owning shares in the stock market. The prices, the shares go uh, become more valuable and you receive those dividends over time also, which further gives you additional income or value from your investment. So what do I get when I buy an ETF? So now we talk about this thing called an exchange traded fund. So what am I actually buying when I buy an ETF? I like to think of it, Mike spoke about the box of chocolates. And that's exactly what it is. It's a hamper. It's a package deal that you're really sort of buying. So think in terms of when you go to the shops now, I'm pretty sure you're going to see Christmas hampers or you're going to see back to school hampers. What does that really mean? It means someone else has already put together a basket of goodies for you. If it's a Christmas hamper, most likely there will be some nice food, maybe some champagne, some chocolate, some goodies in there. You might also have the sort of Christmas hampers that's just good basic food stuff, coffee and tea, biscuits and those sort of things. But someone has already packaged a basket of things for you. If it's the back to school hamper, well, there most likely will be some stationery in there, some books, maybe a, a lunchbox or a nice ruler. So the theme or what is in the hamper really talks about the theme. I've used examples now of Christmas hampers or back to school hampers. And exactly the same applies to an ETF. Each ETF has got a theme associated and that theme is defined by the index that the ETF follows or tracks. So you can buy an ETF that is only investing in mining companies or one that only invests in financial companies, or it could be one that invests in emerging market companies. And so we get many different types of ETFs, just like we get many different types of package deals, boxes of chocolates or hampers over time. So how can one then use these ETFs in your investments to really grow your wealth? The most important thing is that you've obviously got to have an investment account. You've got to be able to buy this into some sort of account. So an investment account of some sort, and we're going to talk about the different sorts just now, but an investment account is, to open that is the first step that you've got to do. And then you will be buying ETFs inside that account or to hold inside that account. So I often get people that say to me, I want to buy a tax-free ETF. There's no such thing as a tax-free ETF. There's also no such thing as a retirement ETF. What you do is you open a tax-free account or you open a retirement annuity account and then you buy ETFs inside of them. Just so that one, just as one can buy many other investments inside a tax-free account or inside a retirement fund, the account type really talks about is it tax-free, is it um, a retirement annuity, or is it just a regular investment account? And then you buy the ETFs inside of that. And those ETFs that you are buying in it, that's exactly where ETF SA comes in, where we assist you in which ETFs to buy and how to buy them. We are what they refer to as we offer intermediary services. In other words, we assist you in getting um, from your money into the ETFs into your particular account. So that that's where we play a role in terms of it. So let's look at three different types of accounts that one can open. So the tax-free investment accounts, great benefits. It's absolutely wonderful. Have you ever heard of anything where you're not paying any tax whatsoever? If you haven't yet, this is it. A tax-free investment account, there is no tax payable of any form. No capital gains tax, no dividend withholding tax, no interest tax, and also, there's no restriction on withdrawal. You can take money out of that account whenever you want to. You're robbing your future self by doing it, let me just tell you that, but you're allowed to. So, um, yeah, sometimes it's good that we get protected from ourselves. But the point is that from a tax-free account, you are allowed to make withdrawals. What are the disadvantages? Well, as I always say, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it must be. So the downside of the tax-free is that there are contribution limits. Limits Currently, on an annual basis, 53,000 Rand. Lifetime contribution limits, 500,000 Rand. So what that means is that per individual who opens a tax-free account, you're not allowed to put more than 33,000 Rand in, in any tax year. So that goes up until the end of February every year. And then come the 1st of March, we're into the new tax year, and then you can invest that again.
The fact that the lifetime limit is 500,000 doesn't mean that you can now quickly go and say, ah, let me just put my 500 grand in and I'm done. No, because you would be in breach of the annual limits. This is only something that can be built up over time. So the sooner you start with a tax-free account, the better. Because it's not about those limits do not apply to how much of the money is tax free. It applies to how much you can contribute. It can grow to an infinite amount of money that is all tax free. But if you don't start today, then in five or 10 or 20 years time, when you want to have the nice big apple tree from which you can draw on a tax free basis, you won't have it because you didn't start early enough in terms of that. So who can open investment tax free investment accounts? Only individuals can do so. So you cannot do this in the name of a company. You cannot do this in the name of a stock fell. You can only do it in the name of a person. And that person can be an adult or it can be a child. It can be a grandchild. There's no age restriction on having a tax-free investment account. Every single South African citizen with South African bank account, people who live in this country, qualify for a tax-free investment account. A brilliant, brilliant dispensation that government offered us for, for the last three years and, and is expected to continue to grow. The other type of account that one can open is a retirement annuity fund. So what are the advantages of a retirement annuity fund? Well, the money that is inside the retirement annuity fund doesn't attract any tax. Again, no capital gains tax, no dividend withholding tax, no interest tax, and furthermore, the money that you put into a retirement annuity fund, so the contributions that you make, is tax deductible, meaning that you don't pay tax on that bit of money. So there are limits to, to that. You can't just put an infinite amount into it. But 27.5% of your taxable income every year, you can contribute to a retirement annuity fund and you don't have to pay tax on that 27.5%, which is quite a powerful way to save tax. So let's say, for example, that you're earning 100,000 Rand and currently you're paying tax on 100,000 Rand you can make contribution of 27,500 Rand to a retirement annuity fund, and then you only pay tax on the 72,500 that remains. A great way to save on your taxes that you currently have to pay. But what are those disadvantages? Well, yeah, government tries to protect us from ourselves and say, we're not going to allow you to access the money there until you're 55 years old. There are some exceptions, but, but by and large, 55 years old before you're allowed to, to um, actually get access to that money. Supposedly, retirement age. We nowadays know that 55, hey, that's like the new 35. Can't even think about retirement at 55. But government hasn't realized that yet, so they do allow us to access it after 55. The other thing also about retirement annuity funds is that they limit, um, the, there are some constraints in terms of how, what you can invest um, inside a retirement annuity money fund. One of those things, for example, you're not allowed to put more than 25% of the money in a retirement annuity fund offshore. So they want 75% of the money to be invested in South Africa. They also say that you're not allowed to have more than 75% of the money in equities, just another name for shares, buying shares in companies. So they want some of the money also in things that will generate um, uh, fixed interest for the investment. So pros and cons to this one as well. Who can actually um, open a retirement annuity fund? Again, it's only somebody, uh, only available for individuals. A company can't do it, Stockfell can't do it, an investor club can't do it, only an individual. And very importantly, you have to be registered for tax. So if you are, for example, we get people that open retirement annuity funds for, for kids, five or six year old. That child first has to be registered for tax before you're allowed to open a retirement annuity fund. I think it's way too early, but let's not go into the details of that sort of thing. The point is that you are only allowed to, to do that once you are registered for tax in South Africa. The third type of account then is just a regular investment account, often also referred to as discretionary investments. And the word discretionary really just meaning that you've got discretion, you can choose how you want to invest that money. So the there's very little um, in terms of benefits of that, but there's also very little rules or lots of freedom in terms of what you can do. So no contribution limits, no constraints on underlying investments. You can do with this whatever you want to, as much as you want to, wherever you want to. 
But the disadvantage is that there's then no tax benefits. No tax benefits on your contributions that you make, and also no tax benefits on the withdrawal. With this one, you're going to be paying full dividend withholding tax. You're going to be paying full capital gains tax when you withdraw money from it. So when it comes to choosing what type of account I should open first and should invest in, can you see why it makes a lot of sense to first make sure that you've maximized the tax savings that you can get with a tax-free investment account and the retirement annuity account before you think about a regular investment account. But having said that, who can do this? Well, anyone can invest in a regular investment account. So if you are part of a stock fail or part of an investment club, this is the type of investment that you could do. I certainly still would recommend that the individuals in the stock fail or the individuals in the investment club also have their own tax-free and retirement annuity investments. But as a group, as a collective, this is the type of account that you can open for the group. It can be done in the name of a company. It can be done in the name of a third party. So we often have people opening regular um, investment accounts or um, ETFSA investor plan accounts for employees or for grandchildren or for a godchild, for example. You can open this in the name of a third party as well. So the choice of the type of account is very much based on do I actually go, where, where am I in terms of my tax journey and what do I need in terms of that? But if I had to pick the single most common question I'm asked, would anyone like to guess what is the question that I get most often? What is the best ETF to buy? Now that's like me saying to you, what's the best food to eat? What's the best drink to have? Well, it depends. It depends on who you are. It depends on what you're looking for. It depends on what you require. It depends on um, are you thirsty for something hot or for something cold? Are you hungry for savory or are you after something sweet? Are you looking for breakfast or for dinner? There's no such thing as one best food to eat or then for that matter, one best ETF to buy. It really does depend on your circumstances and your requirements. So how to choose ETFs for different investment requirements, there's lots of different ways that one can go about it. And certainly we often help clients through the processes of asking questions such as, what is your investment time horizon? Because the investment time horizon will, will determine in large part what sort of risk or what sort of variability um, you can actually um, take on in your investment portfolio. So that's a very f um, important question for us to ask. Another one is how much money do you want to invest? And how frequently is this a lump sum investment or is this a debit order, a regular investment? Because that will determine how do we actually divvy up that money between different ETFs. Very importantly, and also, is what are you actually, what are your investment objectives? What do you need from your investments? Is this about an income? Is it about capital growth? Is it about hedging your currency risk, the RAND exposure? Or is this just about broad-based diversification? And these, these start to get quite complicated questions, especially if you're a first-time investor. And that is where we as ETFSA help you with deciding what is the, the best ETF for you. <laughs> rather than just what is the best ETF to buy. So I'm going to talk to you about just three basic building blocks because I know you're not going to let me walk out of here tonight without giving you three investment ideas of what you can do. So we build up portfolios very much on the basis of a pyramid, of having a very strong proper base for your investment portfolio and then gradually building up from there. Now, the most important building block in an investment portfolio is actually South African shares. With South African shares, I mean companies listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, companies who operate here in South Africa. And why do I say that that's the best investment that anyone can do? You want to be investing there where you live and where you spend your money. You've got to make sure that your investments is aligned with your expenses, where you live, where your, your expenses have to be incurred. And this is the correct um, investment advice for anyone anywhere in the world. Not to buy South African shares, that's not what I mean, but to buy shares in your domestic market. So the market where you live, where you work, and where your expenses are incurred. The second one one then looks at is to say, right, what about the rest of the world? So the second building block for me is about global shares. 
Here in South Africa, we represent less than 1% of the world's GDP economy, and we're also less than 1% of the investment opportunity set in the world. So you've got to ask yourself, why should I expose all of my money to 1% of what's available in the world? So the second investment very much goes towards, let's now look outside of South Africa and look for global shares, global equities. And the third one then is to start diversifying into a different asset class. So property, and in particular listed property, is something quite different than just buying shares in companies. And that would be the third building block that I would add to a long-term wealth creation portfolio. So let's look at some examples of those. So when I talk South African shares, you're really looking at broad base. So a group of shares that cover a big part of the South African market, of the South African economy through that as well. And that typically is within our large cap. So the, the largest companies that are listed here on the JSE, domestic equities. Again, another word just for shares. So the first one that many people would look at is the FTSE JSE Top 40 Index. Mike showed you the example of what's in the Top 40 Index. So by investing in the Top 40 Index, you are buying a little bit of Standard Bank, of Anglo Gold Ashanti, of BHP Billiton, of um, the retailers, Woolworths, um, the banks and the companies that we all know very well. The Top 40 Index gives you that broad-based exposure to the South African market in terms of a single index trade. And we've got four different top 40 ETFs, all giving you exactly the same underlying basket. It's like buying, you get all gold tomato sauce, and you get ku tomato sauce, and you get, I don't know, beacon tomato sauce. I don't even know what other brands of, pick and pay, no-name brand tomato sauce. It's all still just tomato sauce but they are different brands. And so we've got four brand names, four different companies that issue ETFs, Satrix, Stanlip, Ashburton, and Signia. But they all give you exactly the same top 40 index underlying all of them. The second one is the so-called SWIX 40 index. Now, SWIX stands for Shareholder Weighted Index. And all that the JSE has done with that particular index is to say, we've got a lot of companies that are listed here on the JSE that actually are what they call dual listed companies, which means you can't only buy those shares here in South Africa, you can also buy them in London, or you can buy them in Switzerland, for example. So they've got to take account of the fact that these shares are not only available to South Africans, they're also available to people elsewhere in the world. So the JSE removes the amount of shares that belong to people outside of South Africa out of this index and then say, right, what is the South African shareholder weighted index that we've got? And again, we've got four companies that offer that. Satrix, Stanlib, New Funds, which is the brand name for APSA, and Signia. Again, all giving you exactly the same underlying index, just four different brands. We then have an index that S&P Dow Jones offers, the capped South Africa Top 50 Index. So this one is different in two ways. It does 10 additional shares because it's the top 50, not just the top 40. So a slightly broader range of companies that we've got in that index. And very importantly is this thing called capped. Capped means that they place a maximum limit on the amount of money that there can be in a single company, and they cap it at 10%. Mike spoke to you about NASPERS, and you often might hear nowadays how people are talking about the fact that NASPERS is so massive and so big. It's now become, you know, 30, 35% of the JSE's market cap. In this particular product, they cap it at 10% and say NASPERS shall be no more than 10%. And not just NASPERS, any other company. In fact, Richmond is another one that's also capped at 10% in that particular index. And Core Shares, who is the brand name for Grinrod Bank for their ETFs that they offer, they offer an ETF over that capped SA Top 50 index. If you ask me out of all of that, which is my preference for a broad-based domestic equity ETF, so the first one that I would be looking at is the Core Shares Top 50. Now, you might ask me why. Why do I choose that particular one out of all these others that are there? And for me, there's really two reasons why. 
It has the lowest cost. TER stands for total expense ratio, which is really the cost that it costs to put together that fund and to offer it to investors. So it is the least expensive. I don't like the word cheapest. Cheap sounds dirty. It's the least expensive um, ETF that we've got available in South Africa. But very importantly also, it is the most diversified of our domestic equity ETFs. Because they cap it, and you, therefore you necessarily get more exposure to the other shares, but also you've got those 10 extra shares, the 50. So that's my reason for choosing the core shares top 50. What then about global shares? So in terms of global shares, we are now looking at international equities or international companies. We've got some that offer you the whole globe. So in one investment, you can invest in the MSCI World Index. This particular index gives you 1,650 companies all over the world, including a lot of names that you know very well. Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, General Electric, so I can go on. So with one investment that you make here on the JSE, you can buy a little bit of 1,650 companies all over the world. That's pretty powerful. So you are participating in the growth of all of those companies over the world. And in this instance, we've got Signia and Satrix offer us investment into those. But one could also say, well, when you look at the globe, you can go to country-specific investments. So we, for example, have got investments that uh, give you exposure to the USA in particular. We've got Signia giving us the MECI USA index, and then Core Shares, Satrix, as well as Signia, the S&P 500 index, the 500 largest stocks on the US stock exchange. But there's also the UK and Signia, the FTSE 100, is the 100 largest companies in the UK. We've got Europe. Signia's product is the Eurostox 50. It's the 50 largest companies in the whole of the Euro region. And then there's also a Signia Japan product. The MSCI Japan Index gives you investment into the top 300 companies in Japan. By the way, for many of you, Signia Itrix might be a name that you're not that familiar with. Signia earlier this year bought this business from Deutsche Bank, and many of you might be familiar with the term DBX trackers. So the DBX trackers were the brand name of these products. It's exactly the same ETFs. They are now just issued by Signia rather than by Deutsche Bank. So exactly the same ones that you might be more familiar with. There's also regional ETFs that one can look at, and two specific ones that I want to highlight is there's an emerging market ETF. Satrix offers the MSCI Emerging Market, which gives you investment into 23 emerging markets around the globe. Yes, South Africa is part of that, but we're only about 6% of that emerging market index. So you're buying 94% other emerging markets, and most of them have got much better economic growth than we do here in South Africa. Just thought I would mention that. There's also the Cloud Atlas Africa XSA Big 50. This is an index and an ETF that invests in 50 of the largest companies across the African continent, excluding South Africa. So if you're interested in buying exposure to Africa and the growth story in Africa, this is a great ETF with which to do it. But if you now force me and you say, no, you can only choose one, which one will I choose? Well, I'm going to go for the Satrix MSCI World ETF. And the reason why I choose that one is because it gives me exposure to the developed markets, which still is where the biggest equity markets in the world are. Yes, emerging markets are rising, but developed markets are still the biggest. And also because it's got the lowest cost, the lowest total expense ratio, the least expensive, not the cheapest. Right. Then listed property. So when we talk about listed property, this is what is also often referred to as real estate investment trusts, also called REITs. And all that really means is that you're buying exposure to a company that owns a whole lot of physical properties, shopping centers, office blocks, warehouses, and all of these office or, or all of these properties have got lease agreements where there are tenants in there that pay rental to the landlord. And those rentals become then the ownership of the REIT, and you as the investor in the REIT are are earning part of that, the, the fees that are the, 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 what the tenants are paying in terms of their monthly leases. So it's a way for you to get exposure to physical properties 
without having the hassles of getting the tenant calling you at two in the morning because the drain is blocked or because the toilet is not working. So great way to get investment property with a lot less hassle. We have quite a range available on the JSE. There is these um, ETFs that give you exposure to South African listed property companies that have got their primary listing here on the JSE. It really just means this is the, the, the first place where they came and did their listing. CoreShares and Stanlib both have products that give you that specific exposure. Another one that also gives you South African listed property and primary listing, but on an equally weighted basis, is the PropTrax 10 ETF. That takes the 10 largest REITs or property companies on the JSE and invests 10% into each of them. There's also companies that are listed here on the JSE, but their primary listing is somewhere else in the world, which means now you start getting exposure to some international property companies as well. And Satrix has got an, a property ETF that covers that particular one. And then there's a purely global property ETF also, and CoreShares has got the global property ETF. And I just realized I neglected to add on there, Signia very recently also launched an ETF over exactly that same global property. Property, um, index. So you can see a big range of different types of property investments. And my preference in all of this is the Satrix property one for the simple reason that it is not just the lowest TER, but it's the most diversified. It gives you South Africa as well as international property companies at a very, very good cost, a, a very low TER also. So those are the three products that I would start off with in terms of building a portfolio that is suitable for a long term. Mike gave you some great examples of more diversified portfolios also, but these will give you good building blocks to really start building up towards that wealthy portfolio. So in closing from my side, before we take some questions, I think the most important thing is to know what is it that you actually want or need from your investments. Please don't make the mistake of rushing in and saying, I want to buy the thing that's had the best return over the last couple of days or months or weeks or whatever the case might be. That is the worst way to make an investment decision. It's the same as driving a car by looking in the rear view mirror. How far do you think you're going to get before you're going to make an accident? So don't invest on the basis of past performance, but rather, what do I need from my investments? Select the underlying investments or those ETFs and the account type based on your requirements. Should it be a tax-free account? Should it be a retirement annuity account? Should it be a regular investment account? And very importantly, stick to your plan. Don't chop and change every five minutes because of the, the noise that you hear on the news channels or that you see on your social media. Trust that you've got a plan that you're going to stick to to really build up your wealth over the long term. As Mike said, there are now 83 different exchange-traded products listed on the JSC. Complexity is increasing all the time. There are more coming, lots more. We will be over 100 products long before this time next year. So I appreciate that the complexity increases, and that is why we at ETFSA are here to help you. We can help you identify the right account for you, identify the right ETFs for you, and offer what we call these intermediary services. In other words, helping you to make the right investment decisions and to implement them as well. So thank you very much for being here tonight. We're going to give some time for questions now. Um, Narina, I'd just like to thank you. I mean, a lot of you are supporters of ETFSA. A lot of you will become supporters of ETFSA. Uh, we do appreciate the support. We do appreciate all the business and loyalty we get from you. And we'd just like to wish you all the best over the, uh, the holiday season. Spend time with your families. Go on holiday. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. Don't worry about things. Next year is going to be different to this year. We've just seen what happened up in Zimbabwe or, or Bob Mugabe. He got his, uh, his due to rights and all the rest. So... Uh, but, you know, drive safely over the festive season, enjoy yourselves, and, uh, but feel free at any stage to get hold of us. We are a very approachable company. If you've got any questions on investment or things you don't want and you don't understand about ETFs, just get a hold of us, okay? There's some, as, as Narita said, there's some food outside, so please join us outside for something to eat so you can get your stomachs a bit full before you get on the road. Okay.